everybody. So we want to start off by looking at the functions. And so we have five key functions for this. And so our first function is support. So you'll notice the S on the one of the S's on the side. And so the idea with support is this holds up the body and anchors the organs. So with the skeletal system is really, that's probably its number one thing. And so you'll write that along the side with one of the S's. And then it also offers protection. So find the P and you'll write it there along the side with the P and the little fence. And so the idea here is that we prevent soft tissue damage. Um, especially, think about how complete and solid the skull is and how critical the brain is. So we're protecting that soft brain tissue with this really hard structure of the skull. Even the heart and lungs, which are really important, have the rib cage to help protect those as well. Interestingly enough, the abdomen is where we get the least protection. That's where our stomach and intestines are. And these are things that, while they're important, um, they're a little more flexible and we can adjust. And, you know, the small intestine is super long. If we lose a portion of the small intestine, it's not as catastrophic as if we, say, lose a heart. Then we have movement. So this will be the M with the car. So movement, we're acting as levers for muscles to push and pull. So muscles are designed to push and pull, but they have to attach to the skeleton to move the skeletal structure. So in reality, when we talk about movement, movement is a combination. If those muscles are anchored to something, they won't move. If those bones are not connected to a muscle, they don't move. They just are there. Then we have storage. Um, I know people think that's really strange, but this is also part of the reason that often with age, people will start developing issues with osteoporosis or brittle bones or things like that. Um, because the bones are critical in terms of storing calcium and mineral, other minerals, um, as well as some fats and things like that. And if you don't have enough of those minerals in your body, then your body will actually pull them from the bones. And so right now, at, at, during your adolescent years, is actually where you build up the biggest portion of the store for your bones and structure. So it's really important for you to think about making sure you get all of the appropriate nutrients and nutrition, which is interesting because we all know that um, teenagers tend to eat some strange things sometimes, but you really need to be thinking about that. And then the last one, um, some people, it, it goes to the last M for making, um, but really and honestly, the focus, and I wanted you to know this term, hematopoiesis, so that very bottom M across the bottom of your little pentagram. No, not pentagram. Yeah, pentagram. Um, but the, the bottom M is for making, but it's specifically, we have this process called hematopoiesis, which is the formation of red blood cells. Specifically, it's the formation of blood cells, but here, red blood cells. This is where most of our blood cells are made. If there is a problem with anemia, sometimes it's related to nutrient availability, and sometimes the problem is actually in the manufacturing area in the bones where it can't properly develop those cells. So those are our five key functions. And then the other thing I wanted to focus on ties in with this idea, um, and it takes us back to that concept we've been kind of talking about off and on throughout is maintaining homeostasis. And so what we're looking at here, because with bones, we really spend a lot of time focusing on the calcium as the key mineral in storage. 
And calcium is really important for several critical functions in the body as we cover those units. So we have to be able to maintain that calcium level in an appropriate way. So if something happens and the calcium level is too high, let's say for some reason you decided to drink three gallons of milk in a fairly short period of time. So there's a lot of calcium in your system. So we need to deal with that because if it gets too high, it causes problems. If it's too low, it causes problems. So if the calcium's too high, then the thyroid gland, which is like a little butterfly in your throat, produces a hormone called calcitonin. Calcium high thyroid makes calcitonin, which causes the calcium that's in the blood to be absorbed and stored in the bones. Because the idea is we've got to get that calcium out of the blood so the level is back to where it needs to be. Once we've absorbed the calcium, the level will decrease and go back to that maintaining level that we want. Now we can also go the other way. So let's say that you have been eating a whole bunch of junk and there's very little calcium in it and you've used up most of the calcium that's just naturally in your bloodstream. So our calcium level is just simply too low. So it will send a signal to the parathyroid gland so that thyroid gland, that little butterfly shape, it has embedded in it these little dots kind of in the points and that's the parathyroid gland and these produce a substance called PTH or parathyroid hormone, at least that's an easy one to remember, PTH parathyroid hormone and that causes the osteoclasts those cells specifically in the bones to break down bone to release the calcium. So osteoclasts are going to disassemble or break down the bone, releasing calcium into the bloodstream. The calcium levels will rise to bring it back once again to that maintaining level. So that's the whole idea with maintaining homeostasis. Remember, this is a negative feedback system. How I know it's negative feedback is because we're shooting for the opposite. If the calcium's too high, we want to decrease it, make it go to the opposite. If the calcium's too low, we want to increase it, make it go to the opposite.